I don't know if you've ever tried to stop eating sugar before, but um, it's actually really not that hard. You thought I was going to say it's hard. It's really not that hard. It took about 10 days for my brain to stop sending the craving signal after every meal. You know what I'm saying? Like you eat dinner and then the, the signal comes from your brain, like eat this or eat that, or I need to go to the cabinet and find the, the candy that my wife has hidden from me in the cabinet because she will buy candy and doesn't tell me it's there. And I'm like, come on, we share everything, right? Let's, let's share our candy. And so it took about 10 days or so, and the cravings stopped, and we, I basically suffocated the cravings. And we all crave the praise of people and the approval of people, which is the main reason, or one of the main reasons we do the things we do. We communicate the way we communicate. We buy the things we buy. We post the things that we post online, because we crave the approval and praise of man more than the praise and approval of God in Jesus Christ, And we have to suffocate that by the power of God and the grace of God. We have to suffocate that through the word of God. We need God to strip us of uh, the fear of man, the love of people's praise and the love of their approval. I mean, I mean, social media is probably the biggest example that everyone's familiar with. Even if you're not on social media, that we go on there primarily to watch other people perform publicly for approval or ourselves to perform publicly for people's approval, whether that's what uh, the picture or the video or the words that we're writing, we wanna sound clever, we wanna look good, and we might even envy those who are performing publicly and we, we praise them for looking good. And so social media, it's not all bad. I mean, it can be used for good things, obviously. Um, I'm reasonable here, but, but a large part, you know that it's become a platform for public performance. And so we all want this, this praise and approval of people that can only be found Um, by trusting in and being found in by faith in Jesus Christ. God's approval comes in Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done. I don't need your approval and you don't need mine. You need God's approval. I need God's approval and I have God's approval in Jesus Christ by his grace, not because I'm righteous or good and, and you can have God's approval in Christ not because you're righteous and good but because he is kind and merciful and he has chosen you in Christ and he has sent Christ to atone for your sins. We need to look for approval from God, and that's found in Jesus Christ. This is such a serious issue spiritually that if we take it down to the level of the gospel and eternal salvation, people have lost their soul forever because they chose the approval of people and the praise of people over the praise of God in Jesus. I mean, people have chosen, and we'll see in our passage, people have chosen the praise of man over the praise of God in Jesus Christ, and they have perished forever because of that. That's how, that's how weighty this is. And even as a believer, it, it, we, we sometimes do things even religiously or in this room where, where the way in which we posture ourselves in this room as we sing or the way in which we act in this building is primarily to, so that others see us in a certain light in how we even worship. And so we really need Jesus. We really need the grace of Jesus. We're all messed up. Even in our, our worship, there's mixed motives. And, and where you find a craving for people praise, you will always find unbelief. Where you find a craving for the praise of people, you will always find with it unbelief. And unbelief, you will always find with that disobedience to Christ. The fear of man lays a snare, the Proverbs say. But he who trusts the Lord is safe. The fear of man is a trap. It traps you. And even as a believer, it traps you. It catches you. But he who trusts the Lord and fears the Lord and lives unto the Lord only, who lives for an audience of one. You've heard that saying before. I love that saying. Truly is a great saying to live for an audience of one. We care about people. We consider people. We listen to their thoughts and their opinions and their uh, preferences. We are kind and we are considered and reasonable people, but we don't live for their approval. We live for the approval of God in Jesus Christ. We don't earn that approval, we receive that approval by grace. Paul said this in Galatians 1, verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I would not be a servant of Christ. So the difficult text in John 12, go to John 12. In John 12, 36, through 43, we will discover the perils of loving people praise. The perils of loving the praise of people are craving and living for the glory that comes from people. For the unbeliever, the peril is 
ultimately rejecting Christ in favor for temporal praise of humans. And if you're a believer, if you do belong to Christ and follow him, the peril is choosing the praise of people and disobeying Christ in the process. So let's look together at verse 36, the second half. When Jesus had said these things, he departed. He departed. Remember, he was talking to them about believe in the light while you can, walk in the light, believe in the light, become a son of light through faith. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. That's a very intentional action. Notice how intentional that is. Jesus is not just leaving the temple and leaving the crowd, but he is actually hiding himself from them. That's a physical as well as a spiritual implication. Jesus is the source of light and life, and he's hiding that from them. He's hiding himself from them. Verse 37, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe. In a way, he withdraws because of their hardened unbelief, their rejection of all the signs and all the evidence and all the teaching. Jesus sees their unbelief and he's given them everything they need to believe. They still don't believe. And so Jesus withdraws. He leaves the temple for the time. He hides himself from them. Jesus is actively hiding, actively departing. And this is a sign of judgment on unbelief, on hardness, on stubbornness, on blindness, intentionally found in their hearts. John 1, 14, remember it says, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So when we look at Jesus, when we see Jesus live in the scriptures and die and rise, we're seeing the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God incarnate and personified and that glory departs and he hides the glory of God from them. It reminds me in Ezekiel 10, as I wrote this, I thought about Ezekiel 10 where God, because of wickedness and corruption and hardness and idolatry, the glory of God actually departs from the temple. And Ezekiel sees this and it goes over the hill. The glory of God leaves the temple, leaves and hides and departs from the temple. Jesus, the glory of God is hiding and departing from them for their idolatry and unbelief. The priest Eli's daughter-in-law in 1 Samuel 4, the ark is taken by the Philistines. Eli falls over and dies. His daughter-in-law's husband dies. And when she hears that the ark is captured, she's about to have a son and she has this son. She dies giving birth to her son. And what does she name him? Ichabod. Ichabod. The glory has departed. The glory has departed. And when Jesus hides himself, in a very real way for that generation of those who rejected Jesus in Israel, the glory had departed. Jesus Christ, the glory and image of God, had departed from them and hid from them. What signs had they rejected? Well, they had rejected at least seven, but we know Jesus did more than that. But in the Gospel of John, at least seven, he had turned water to wine. He had healed the official son. He had healed the paralytic at the pool on the Sabbath day. He had fed 5,000, he had walked on water, he had healed a man born blind, and he had raised Lazarus from the dead, and yet they still said, nah, we're good without you. We don't need you, we don't want you, and we certainly don't believe in you. It really is stunning that they could, and, and we would have done the same thing, by the way, without God's grace. We would have rejected the evidence, rejected the signs, rejected the son without the grace of God. Why did they not believe? After all the evidence and after all the signs, after, as the very glory of God, word of God was with them in their presence, why did they not believe? And now here's where this text gets really difficult and the elders and I discuss this at length. So as we dive into these truths we're about to cover, I want you to remember that we do not form our view of God and our doctrine based on what we want to be true or we think should be true, but based on what the scripture reveals to us. And I'm telling you this morning, this is a really great opportunity for us to exercise faith. Faith in the word of God as God has given it to us. And I promise you're gonna have to receive this by faith. Why did they not believe? And here is the simple answer from the text. It was a fulfillment of scripture. 
The unbelief of this generation in face of all the signs was a fulfillment of scripture. Look with me. Verse 38, 37. Though he had done so many signs before him, them they still did not believe in him. Verse 38, watch this. So that, why did they not believe? So that, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. There it is. Their unbelief is so that scripture, Isaiah, might be fulfilled. And here it is. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Why did they disbelieve? Because Isaiah prophesied in scripture that they would. What did Jesus say? He said, scripture cannot be broken. When God speaks, it comes to pass. Not one jot, one tittle can be broken. Scripture cannot be broken. Isaiah predicted that the generation of Jesus Christ, when he walked the earth, Lord, who has believed? Who has believed? They fulfilled scripture by not believing. By not believing. But it gets even harder. So that's they would not believe. But he goes further than that here. And here's where it gets more difficult, where we need to receive the word as it is, church. They could not believe. Not that they just would not, but they could not. Watch, verse 39. Therefore, they could not believe. Could it be even more clear? They could not believe. Guys, I don't make stuff up. We don't make stuff up. We receive the word. They could not believe. Why? Because of more scripture. For again, Isaiah said, look at this. He has blinded their eyes. Who is he? God. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. I want you to notice two things before we keep moving. Number one, they would not believe. They refused to believe of their own will. You can be sure that the unbelief of any person in history is indeed their fault. It is indeed their fault. Unbelief is a, a human sin. They would not believe. It was also a fulfillment of Isaiah. Then layer number two, deep down, is they also could not believe. Why? Because Isaiah also prophesied that God would blind their eyes and harden their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Here we are presented with something extremely difficult that is largely rejected because of the emotional difficulty, maybe even the logical difficulties. We are presented with the doctrine of election and its corollary, reprobation. Election and reprobation. First, election. God does indeed choose who he will save. And he chooses who he will save before the foundation of the world. And he chooses whom he will save before they do anything good or bad. So it is unconditional. God doesn't choose you based on your foreseen faith. He doesn't choose you. Faith, faith is something good. And so God doesn't look at you and say, He's, he has good faith and therefore I choose him or her. God doesn't choose you based on your works. God chooses you because God is love and God chooses to choose you. <laughs> Could it be any more clear than that? God chooses of his own will, Romans 9 through 11 say, of his own will, of his own purpose. That's election. But if you follow the doctrine of election, that also means that God chose not to choose others. Reprobation. If God chooses some, that automatically means that he chose not to choose the others, not to save the others. That is what I mean by reprobation. Reprobation is the logical consequence of election. God's choice to not elect the others. Now, if God makes this decision before time, that guarantees that some will be saved and some will not be saved, right? If God makes a choice of his own sovereign will, that guarantees the destiny of creatures. It guarantees it. And at the same time, anybody who perishes, anybody who rejects Christ, anybody who refuses to believe in sins is guilty in and of themselves. They will be punished for their sins and their unbelief. No one goes to hell as an innocent. 
and no one is saved by their works. No one goes to hell by their innocent, in their innocence, and no one is saved by their works. Do you see what I'm saying? So when you talk about God choosing us, Ephesians 1, and predestining us in love for adoption, when you talk about election, you also have the doctrine of reprobation. Augustine said it this way, no one is redeemed except through unmerited mercy. Mercy. And no one is condemned except through merited judgment. No one suffers the wrath of God as an innocent person. They suffer for their sins. God is just. He will not punish someone who is innocent. And the problem is none of us are innocent. So if we're gonna be saved, it is through unmerited mercy. In the canons of Dort in the early 1600s, here is how these men described the doctrines of election and reprobation and the nuances of it. And I, I want you to follow me here. This is very detailed, but I think it's important that we go here. Moreover, they say, Holy Scripture most especially highlights this eternal and undeserved grace of our election and brings it out more clearly for us and that it further, further bears witness that not all people have been chosen, but that some have not been chosen or have been passed by in God's eternal election. Those, that is, concerning whom God, on the basis of his free, most just, irreproachable, unchangeable pleasure, made the following decision, to leave them in the common misery and sin into which, by their own fault, they have plunged themselves. Not to grant them saving faith and the grace of conversion, but finally to condemn and punish them, having been left in their own ways and sins under his judgment, just as everybody deserves not only for their unbelief, but also for their other sins in order to display God's justice. And this is the decision of reprobation, which does not at all make God the author of sin, a blasphemous thought, but rather it's the fearful, irreproachable, just judge and avenger. Canons of Dort, section 115. This is why I was saying, as we hear Isaiah say, Isaiah says, who has blinded the minds and eyes of these people in the text, it is God. It is God, and we can't get away from that. We can't say God didn't blind their eyes and their hearts. God didn't harden them because it's, a, it's an active verb. God hardened and he blinded as an act of judgment according to his own will. And, and here's the difficulty we face here. And I'm not saying this is at all easy to accept. Uh, it's very difficult. I, I thought about this for all week and then last night I hardly slept thinking about this because it's so serious and weighty and heavy. So I understand church, it's heavy, it's weighty. And here's the difficulty. Uh, we often start with God can't do that. That's not just. Why doesn't God save everyone? But the question is, why does God save anyone? No one deserves mercy. I don't deserve mercy. I'm a sinner. You don't deserve mercy. You're a sinner. So for God to have mercy on one of us is, is abundantly merciful. For God to have mercy on 10 of us or 100 of us or the countless billions of people throughout history that God has had mercy on or will have mercy on, that is the question. Why does God show mercy to anyone when we have so blasphemed and dishonored his holy name? We often start with our position. What about us? but we need to try to start from God's position. We have blasphemed God. So why would a just and holy God who's been infinitely offended by our sin, why would he have mercy on anyone? Because he's merciful. Because he's good. Because he's kind. And so we have to take, don't we have to take Isaiah at face value? Don't we have to take the scriptures at face value? As hard as it is, Verse 39, look back at John 12. Therefore, they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, he's blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, lest they see and understand and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke of him. Now, I want us to go to Romans chapter nine, and then we'll move on to the final section. Romans chapter nine, verse 10. And by the way, how God goes about hardening this generation or certain people, how God goes around blinding, as Isaiah says, 
How he actually accomplishes that, no one knows. Why? Because God is just, God cannot sin, God cannot tempt people with sin, God cannot be tempted by sin. God is never the author of evil, he can do no evil. So, so how we uphold uh, God's justice and purity and his hatred of evil and, and how we uphold him actively uh, hardening or blinding certain people or this generation of Israelites, uh, that harmony between the two is for God to know. It is for God to know. Which is why I said we receive the word by faith. Romans 9, verse 10. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, there it is, though they had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but by, because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it's written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. There it is, election, reprobation. What shall we say then? Okay, now, now God himself through scripture is gonna answer our objections and he's gonna show us how to really respond to this. What shall we say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. What's our first objection? That's not right. That's not right. God, you have no right to say, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And Paul says, is there injustice? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Verse 16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. 10 times God hardens Pharaoh's heart. 10 times Pharaoh hardens his own heart. How do you put those two together? Don't try, just affirm it. You don't try. Did Pharaoh harden his heart? Yes. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes. How those things harmonize together in God's eternal decree and wisdom, we do not know. For this very purpose, I've raised you up that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Watch this. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Here's our second second objection. Verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Here's how we are to respond to this. But who are you, a man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? He's the potter. We are the pot. He's the potter. We are the clay. If I built my sofa from scratch that's in my living room, my sofa has no right to turn around and say, why have you constructed me like this? Why do you sit on me that way? Because I made it. Verse 22, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So church, look, I I spend so much time on this because when you read something in Isaiah that says God hardened, God blinded, that has to be addressed. We need to think deeply and carefully about that. And the response is not, God, you can't do that. And why do you still find fault with us? The response is you are the potter. We are the clay. You are God. We are not This is why Romans 11 says how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given him a gift that he should be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen? Who has been his counselor? We can't sit and say, God, you're wrong. Why do you still find fault? Why did you make us this way? Why did you choose this way? Because God is God and he's the only God. How arrogant it would be for us to say, you are wrong, God. You are wrong. You can't do that. You can't act the way you wanna act. No, he's the potter, plain and simple. We must be like Job, What does Job say at the end of the book of Job where where God says, where were you when I made this, 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 and this, little man? (laughs) Gird up your loins. Be a man. Answer me. You have courage, Job? And what does Job say? I've seen him, 
And now I know I spoke about the things I did not understand. I shut my mouth and I say, you are God. You are God. I trust you. So in our text, as a transition to the next section, why in church history and and why in, in this period has the majority of Israel rejected their Messiah? Because there's a remnant of Jews who believe in their Messiah, both then, throughout church history, and even now. Why, why have the majority of Jews, though, rejected their Messiah? Why, why did God harden them, the Israelites, in this time and in times sometimes following? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 11, verse 25, verse 25, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers, a partial hardening. There it is. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. There's a hardening from God that the gospel will go to the Gentiles. Many, 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 many Gentiles will believe in the Jewish Messiah as Lord and Savior. They will come into the church. They will come into the family of God. And then there's coming a generation of Jews in the future from us where in a certain generation that no one knows, Israel as a nation will repent. There's a hardening, a blinding. The gospel goes primarily to the Gentiles. Some Jews continue to believe, but the fullness of the Gentiles right now, brothers and sisters, is coming into the church and believing and receiving the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ. And then there's a coming generation of Jews that will repent and believe and be saved. We see that in Romans 11. And Paul just says, how inscrutable are his ways? Who has known his mind? How wise and just and merciful and good is God? And our response, faith, submission, worship, trust. Our response is to believe in Christ, to run for refuge in Christ, to run for salvation in Christ, to take hold of Jesus Christ. Don't think about, hey, who's elect and who's, don't think about that. The answer is, have you heard about Jesus and do you want to believe in him and do you believe in him and have you joined his ranks? Come to him by faith. If you believe in Jesus and you truly follow him and you've surrendered to him and and you want Jesus, that's a great sign. There's no need to fear. There's no need to fear. When we say reprobate, we're talking about that person who is hardened who, who wants nothing to do with Christ, who, who does not love Christ, who, who has no interest in Christ or following Christ. We're talking about the person who knows, even if they're in church, they, they, they give assent to some facts, but they know in their life, they keep Jesus out of their life. Like, it's very obvious. So the scriptures are not asking you to be perfect. They're asking you to trust in the perfection of Christ for you, the righteousness of Christ for you, to follow Christ, to surrender to Christ, Rest in Christ. The answer is not to look in. The answer is always to look out to Christ. What John is doing is he's coming, he's giving us a picture back here. He's giving us a picture above the situation. We're down here in the situation. And the call is to follow Christ, believe in Christ, find refuge in Christ who died for our sins. And then we come back to the final sentiment of the text and the application of the text which I started with at the beginning, which is some people choose the praise of people, the approval of people over the praise of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Look with me at verse 42. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. That sounds good so far, but that sounds bad. For fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved, here it is, the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Where do we get the primary application of the text? We get it from right there. That the the knowledge of Christ can come to you, the gospel of Jesus incarnate and, and crucified in your place for your sins. He's risen from the dead. He's Lord of all. He's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. He offers you forgiveness and eternal life for free grace to receive by faith. And you have options, two options. You can receive him, 
find the approval of God in him by his blood and his righteousness, or you can look out and you can say, man, if I become a Christian, if I follow Jesus, these people won't like me as much. They might harm me, they might reject me, they might ostracize me, they might kick me out of their circles. And it seems like in the text, the authorities chose the latter. The authorities said, I don't wanna be kicked out of the synagogue and I will not confess Jesus before men. And, And Jesus would call this being ashamed of the gospel. Choosing the praise of people, the glory of man, the approval of man over the approval of God that's found only through faith in Jesus Christ. Not by works, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So my question comes to you because I never want to assume that you've chosen the praise of God in Jesus over the praise of man. Have you chosen Jesus? Is he everything for you? Is he everything for you? Are you in Jesus by faith alone? And are you following Jesus by faith alone? If not, believe in the light while you can. Repent. Come under his lordship. Surrender to him. Trust in him. Come to him. Drink of him. Receive him. Believe in the light. Become a son of light. And here's what I'll say to the believers in the room who are saved and secure and beloved and treasured and forgiven and righteous and well-pleasing to God in Jesus Christ. Here is the temptation you will face every day, and here it is, to publicly perform for others, in church and out of church. And here's my pastoral exhortation that is so detailed and complex. Stop performing for others. Stop performing for others. Stop performing for others on social media. Just stop. Stop saying things to be seen by others. Stop posting things to be seen by others. Stop worshiping a certain way because of how others perceive you or not worshiping a certain way because how others perceive you. Stop performing publicly for others. And simply ask the question that we asked weeks back and in ABF was asked this morning, how in this moment, as a forgiven and beloved child of God by grace, how do I now honor and please the Savior who saved me? How do I speak right here? How does my tone need to be? How do I interact with these people uh, over holidays when my family's in town and that uncle and that aunt and that cousin are here? How do I interact with them in such a way that, that doesn't show off me, but shows off Christ? I'm not performing publicly so that they like me or they see me a certain way. I am serving Christ so that Christ is displayed. That's it. And so this text comes to bear on the unbeliever Don't choose the praise of men, choose Jesus Christ, follow Jesus Christ, trust in him. And it comes to the believer, which is stop performing publicly on all platforms and simply live to display and honor the savior who saves you by grace. That's it. That's your life in every realm of life. That's your goal in every realm of life. Oh God, help us. Let's pray for that help. Our Father, we thank you for your word that is true and awesome and wonderful and also very difficult. Father, I've prayed all week that you would give me and us faith to receive your word, even if we feel badly about certain things in it or things feel wrong. But Lord, may we submit to your word like Job. May we submit to the words of Isaiah who are here quoted by John. May we leave the secret things to the Lord our God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. May we stop seeking the approval of people, but realize it's found only in the Son of God, crucified in our place, risen from the dead, perfect and spotless and holy Lamb of God who takes away our sins. And so that we have peace with you through Jesus Christ and faith in him. We have no condemnation through Jesus Christ and faith in him. We our beloved in Jesus Christ and through faith in him. And now we don't live to show off and perform for people, but to display the excellencies of Jesus Christ in how we speak and how we act and how we display him with our attitudes when we're in private, when we're in public, not considering the thoughts of people, considering the glory of God. Oh, how we need your grace even to live the Christian life. We trust you that you're working in us, your purposes and the good works you prepared beforehand for us to walk in, make us zealous and fruitful and filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with the word of Christ and a passion for God's glory and holiness and righteousness and mercy. 
kindness, fruits of the Spirit. Lord, sanctify us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Sanctify us, O Lord. Strengthen us. Refresh us as we receive the Supper. We pray in the great name of Christ. Amen.